I'm Eric Russell. I am out and about today at Richmond Triangle Players with Tom DeHaven. He is a writer, author, and journalist, and is a big comic book fan, and has written two books on the subject of Superman. One, a great novel called It's Superman, set in the 1930s, and then his newest one, Our Hero, Superman on Earth. And we're here to discuss 75 years of Superman. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thanks for asking. I remember the first time I bought my first Superman comic. It was 1976, my Gaga took us to the book nook, we were going to go to the beach for the first time as a family, and she said, pick out six comics. And one of them was an action comics that featured Superman, and I was hooked. <laughs> just, we got to the beach, and I'd see comic racks, and I was like, ooh, I've got money, and I just bought them all up, and then every Friday, comics, comics, comics. But Superman has always been one of my favorites. Do you have a? Do you remember the first comic that you bought the first time? First Superman comic, or just first comic or first Superman? Well, I can remember uh, I Am Metropolis action comics. I forget that was the cover. Uh, that was the cover story. I Am Metropolis. I don't know what year that was. Fifty eight, fifty nine. Um, so yes, I remember. Um, and uh, I was I was a Superman fan during the Silver Age, you know, the Mort Weisinger Age. And, Action comics and adventure comics and Superboy and mm -hmm. Superman and Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen and World's Finest. Those were the Superman comics every month that I that I bought. Because his first appearance in Action Comics number one, published in the late spring of '38, um, really was something that thrilled audiences across the globe. I mean, this was the first superhero. Um, what do you think? Kind of well, before you get to that. Let's talk about what are superheroes, who needs them, how do we define them, what function do they serve, and what are kind of like our own expectations of them? Of superheroes? You know, it's, it's, I think that the, the, the um, function of superheroes has changed as any kinds of, of art or media change over the years, if it's going to survive, you know? Um, what Superman meant to people in 38, and 39, and 40 at the time you know, late depression, time when it was clear to everybody that war was coming, war had already started, you know, was starting in Europe. It's different from what it meant to kids and, and teenagers at that time than it meant in the post-war years. And, you know, so it's hard, it's hard to answer that question. But I think, that, you know, the idea of a superhero is simply, a, you know, a kind of a iconic hero. Uh, and what do you need heroes for to show um, the best that people can do to, to kind of define who you are, define who your society, what your society is, those kinds of things. And then the superheroes that presumably just do it on a grander, uh, grander level. Because you, know? you went for like, the, they went for those pulp things, the masked men to Superman, and then that whole pantheon of heroes kind of followed afterwards with Batman, Wonder Woman, then yeah. my, my other big fave, Captain Marvel. Yeah, you know, it happened so quickly. I mean, I, I don't think Superman... There was a book out this year, last year, called Superman, um, mm -hmm. and it, uh, it had reprinted comic strips from around 37, 38. And there were some kind of, you could say, super-powered heroes um, before Superman in the, in the early comics that were basically based on this, the, the science fiction pulps yeah. and Flash Gordon. And, but I think the thing about Superman, why he was so important, uh, is that he kind of, uh, unconsciously or consciously on the basis part of the, of the creators had all these elements that just hit at the right time. Uh, the orphan, the immigrant, yeah. you know, uh, the little guy you know, who had the common man's interest in, at heart and, and all those kinds of things at the same time as the New Deal. Um, so I think uh, he pulled it all together and, um, and that's why Superman really is the first, even though there might have been some super-powered flying him. people before him. When we talk about heroes and superheroes being, are they universal? Are they culturally defined? Is because when I when I've done my research over the years and stuff, it seems like it's something that's uniquely American. It's a unique American writing form. It's a unique art form. Are they are they just centered on a certain time period, age, certain interest groups, and why is it that female superheroes don't seem to have that? I want to see the same staying power, other than Wonder Woman, whose book has never been canceled. 
women superheroes don't seem to stay or last as long. We've had Phantom Girl, we've had how many incarnations of Black Canary, Hawk Girl, we've got two versions of Supergirl, we've got Supergirl Earth One, then we have Power Girl, and then even on the Earth One Supergirl, she's been an alien clone, she's been a small girl from the Midwest who merged with the clone, then she came back out of nowhere, and then we had the 52. We won't talk about the 52. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, the interesting thing to me when I was writing uh, Our Hero, um, uh, it was great to research some things and to find things out, uh, to find a lot of what I believed was wrong. For instance, uh, girls read the early comic books just as much as the boys. Okay. Um, and uh, the difference was that in the early years, the 30s and the 40s and into the 50s, girls dropped out a little earlier than boys. Okay. So they, they weren't reading in the past like eighth grade, 14 years old. They went into high school, they didn't read comics anymore unless it was Betty and Veronica. Okay. You know? But the girls read comic books, they read superhero comic books. Um, and I thought it was pretty interesting that they didn't differentiate, like girls weren't looking necessarily, I want to have girl heroes. Right. You know, they they read Captain Marvel. Well, they, well, they read Mary Marvel though. I mean, she was a she was, she was like yeah. The, but it's, it wasn't that a girl said, "Oh, I got it." They only read Wonder Woman. They didn't, you know. Uh, so in fact, a lot of the heroic stuff of the comics was appealing to young girls, at least at that time, uh, as boys. I think later on, as, as time went on, the fifties and sixties, girls did not read comic books, you know, as a differentiated between that only boys who are, you know, science fiction fans and, you know, model kit fans and all that, they, they read comic books, you know, and, and, and girls don't. But now, I mean, in, com in cartooning, I mean, there weren't a lot of girls reading comics, but there weren't a lot of women in comics. Right. Interesting thing now is if you look at comics, uh, women cartoonists pretty much outnumber in the alternative field men at this point. So women uh, are back into comics, but if you look at it, they don't really write or, or draw much superhero material. But they're out there doing other, other storylines yeah. and stuff, like, yeah. um, I've tried to remember, I think, Love and Rockets and stuff. I know Gail Simone, who's penned Batwoman or Batgirl for a while, she did a whole run of Wonder Woman for yeah. a period and just yeah. really enjoyed those those things. Yeah. Is it truly an American art form? Is it something that's, that can only have happened in the U.S. at a certain time period? I think so. I, mean, I, th up? I think that kind of, uh, uh, that, that, you know, the cape hero, the masked hero, the, you know, that that Batman evolved from, you know, the, the Scarlet Pimpernel, the, the was supposed yeah. to be a French character, was, you know, a, a, an American novel. And, um, so I think yes, and, and that, that the very uh, notion of the, the feisty young guy, the superhero, that's the early superheroes, is very kind of American. And it, and it didn't catch on in Europe uh, in the ways that, for instance, Tintin has never caught on here, yeah. you know? Um, and asterisks, you know, things that are huge in comics in Europe don't quite catch on here, and vice versa. I, I think uh, in the in the Marvel years in the mid '60s, you know, uh, comics sold fairly well in, in England, but not really in the rest of the Italy and the places that had large comic yeah. reading public didn't really take to American. They did their own stuff, you know. Uh, what they would pick up from American pop culture was cowboy stories, cowboy stories, yeah, which we weren't even. Considering in in those days, you no, know, so the superheroes really is, I think, an American. Because the, the first kind of original ones from that from the '30s and '40s was the masked hero. You had the first Adam. You had all these mystery men where it was a costume that was kind of bright colored and garish, and then just this determination to fight crime. And then we had those '40s with the war with Spy Smasher and the Justice Society all fighting Hitler, and there was a cover of Captain America and he's slugging Hitler. Right, number one. And then you go in there and, you know, he's solved this whole thing right then and there during that time period. And then over at Fawcett we saw Captain Marvel with Captain Nazi and you saw some of those great iconic images which we see replayed during the war. Do you think that fueled that whole industry? You know, because comics were shipped over to GIs oh at that point. Yeah, it, it's a very good case could be made that had it not been for World War II. Uh, comics might not have turned into uh, this important element of, of pop culture. Yes, um, the first kids who were reading Superman, you know, when it came out in '38, um, uh, you know, 12, 14 years old. You know, a few years later, they, they were in fact soldiers, um, so they had brought that with them. And then, uh, a great percentage of the comic books that were sold were actually bought by the United 
United States government during the war and then just distributed and people who hadn't read comic books were reading them because they weighed next to nothing you could stick them in your bag you know it was easier to carry around than a book yeah um, and so I think um, certainly the, the, the numbers of sales during World War II uh, were, were fantastic um, and then they dropped of course right after uh, the, the 50s and 60s you had the whole thing against comics you had the seduction of the innocent deal William Gaines is in front of the Senate Commission comics are destroying America the, you had the beginning of the Comics Code Authority you couldn't show blood and gore you couldn't show law enforcement in a negative way and so the stories took a whole new twist but I think it kind of pushed the medium because the artwork went up and you could see that they were kind of giving you the stories within those confines but still giving you great storytelling hitting those undercurrents and stuff oh, yeah. you know I think that the, the uh, 50s uh, comic books are underrated uh, because if you you know if you look at a lot of them they were the fantastic comics yeah. it's, it's one of those things about working within with the restrictions you know uh, uh, used to say when when sex was censored in novels you right. know there was a lot of ingenuity was going on um, uh, to get a, get around that and be suggested and I, I think the storytelling in 50s comic books were, was really very good and you're right the art improved I mean and, and since comics had to be turned toward younger readers because of all these restrictions, the best children's comics that have ever been made in this country were came out in the late '40s. And, you know, Carl Barks and stuff, and, and Little Lulu. And those were great comic books, you know. And then when the first superheroes came back in '56 again, um, they had the restrictions about what they could show and what they couldn't show. And so people like Carmen Infantino, you know, used used modern graphic design mm -hmm. to uh, make these comic books look really new with the long narrow yeah. panels and very imaginative graphic design that a lot of kids were introduced to for the first time and so yeah you had restrictions on what the stories could do and yeah I mean like they weren't meant for 19 year old men they were they're meant for 12 and 13 year old kids and, and if you could look at those books with that mind they're great little stories they're fantastic yeah. which can which we move ahead through the time period we come into the first thing because when I was the first time the big celebration was when he turned 50. Oh. I still have, I, when he turned 50. And I kept thinking, well, where will I be 25 years from now? Will <laughs> Superman still be relevant in 25 years? And we come upon 75 years later. And what I think is fascinating that the image they chose, here's 25 years ago, and here's 75 years later, the image is still the same. It's still the red trunks, it's still the red cape, it's the big S, it's the spit curl. Um, What's his staying power? You know, some of the other heroes in that time period, when we hit the 50s, 60s, and 70s, shifted to science fiction origins. Green Lantern went from having a magic ring to he's part of a giant space core. Hawkman's from outer space. The atom now shrinks down to microscopic size. And then you get into the era that I picked up on comics, which in DC's era would be like the satellite years. You start to have the Earth 1, Earth 2 crossovers. But why has he lasted 75 years? I mean, what is what makes him so effective? What am, what's his appeal? Why here now in 2013 is the Man of Steel, you know, still shining bright as, a, as an icon? Well, I th the interesting thing is I like that you showed those two images because it's true. I think people who read comic books, who are into comic book culture and are interested in month-to-month -month changes and... and and that whole proliferation of a, of a continuity and how this all fits together. Mm -hmm. That's one way of looking at right. this character. That's not, I mean, and, and you know, the sales of comic books these days, like a Superman comic book, is probably well under 100,000. Yeah. You know? um, I don't know how much it fluctuates, but it's a, you know, we're, to, you know, we're in a country of 300 million people, so 100,000 copies right. doesn't mean a lot. What people think in this country of Superman is this image that they had 25 years yeah. ago and they had 50 years ago that, and it has these very basic qualities you know and they don't read the comic books maybe yeah. they see the movies maybe right. they don't uh, but, but which is very very interesting and when I did this book Our Hero that's really what the idea was this was part of a series on icons and there's a book in the series on the hamburger okay. the electric chair you know uh, Fred Astaire so and they said what well, I do one on Superman, but as an icon, and uh, and there's certain iconic 
qualities about him, certain things that everybody has, yeah. everybody shares. Which is why, you know, I don't really care myself, but when he lost his trunks with this, you know, people said, well, that's not Superman, he doesn't have his trunks. You know, it's, and it's the, the, one of my thoughts in, the, in this book was that it's the uniform, yeah. the costume. Is it, you know, you, you, you can't mess with that for long. You cannot, you know no. what I mean? And because that's what people think of when they see. So, for instance, when I saw the chain mail six months ago on the posters for the new Superman, I'm saying, yeah. he doesn't have chain mail. <laughs> you know? So, uh, I think Superman lasts because he looks a certain way to everybody and he has certain qualities. Yeah. He, he's a philanthropist, you know, he just does things because he wants to do it. He, he's, a, he's a common. He, He's interested in the common man, the common good. He came from Krypton. He's an orphan. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he's a self-made person, uh, and that's it. You know, they have certain there's certain things, and everybody can say it about Superman. And we know we know his look has changed artistically over the years. Before it was like a strong man Samson suit. He had the red lacy up deals, and the S wasn't the big diamond shield. Right. I mean, they even show it here. It was a little triangle, and then over the years, it's changed. You know, whether it's you know. George Reeves, Christopher Reeves, Dean Cain. The, the S, though, has seemed to take it on its whole life of its own. I mean, you see people with the, the S-Shield tattoo everywhere. You pick up coffee mugs. You see matchbox cars. It's still that, what I call the iconic, classic Superman mm -hmm. with the red trunks, the whole deal. How, how that S evolved in the 40s to what it is now, that is, to me, one of the great icons, one of the great, great graphic icons. Yeah, it's clean. Um, you know exactly. Yeah. That's what you know it is. What it, that's what it is. You'll see it on tattoos, mm -hmm. t-shirts, all kinds of stuff, and it's it's, it's beautiful. You know, it, because you look at other heroes, things like the Flash. Well, some people go, "Oh, is that Captain Marvel?" Because it's a yellow lightning bolt. And go, "No, they're two different things." But you get that cross confusion. Yeah. You know, does it does it really speak to you? Does it? Do you think he'll make it to a hundred? Twenty five years from now, will Superman still be <laughs> truth, justice, the American way? Or, yeah, I think so. You know, um, as I said, who, who draws him, who writes him, who runs the company that owns him, that all changes. And, and who knows, um, you know, 25 years, I have my doubts that there'll be monthly comic books. Because they've gone digital. Digital media is right. huge now. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm on my iPad, so I, I look at Comixology and I say, well, now they're up there. They're yeah. Um, but whether even the monthly things change, I, I think the character will be around in some form or another. Look at me, you know, our last 10, 15 years, how many iterations of Superman, right? Yeah. There was Smallville, uh, there was Lois and Clark in the 90s, right? Yeah. And, and the movies, the, the animated show around the 2000s. I mean, that's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of versions of this character. And it's, we're not even talking about what happened in the comic. I can remember Saturday mornings, the Super Friends, yeah. Challenge of the Super Friends, then Superman had his own show for a while, and then we hit the 80s and 90s, and then the first superhero to come back was Batman the Animated Series. Then they followed with The Adventures of Superman, which had that Bruce Timm style, but they really gave us some great Superman storylines. Mm. They threw in, you know, Dark Side, and they had, you know, characters died, and I thought, that's huge. Here's a kid's program, and a main character has been killed, and he's suffering for it. Then we moved into Justice League, Justice League Unlimited, and now we've got all the other movies that have come afterwards, and it kind of reintroduces two new generations of kids because not every kid can pick up a comic book on a, you know, at a five and dime or a small mom and pop bookstore. You go to That's you right. do specialty shops. Unless you have someone who takes you, where do you find comics? Yeah. Do you think as media progresses, we're going to see more, more stuff along those lines, more animated shows, more, you know, yeah, I think where so. are they going to go think with these we're commercially? About. Where are they going to go? Well, uh, I, I, you know, Commercially, it all depends on how the technology goes. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think there'll be digital shows, and you know, um, Superman will probably not be on paper forever, but he will be on you know iPads and all those kinds of things. And the cartoon shows—I mean, hardly hardly five years go by without some new version of a Superman in a cartoon show. And you're right; you know, like, it's what I was saying at the beginning of this: Superman has to change generationally like you can't have the same Superman stories that you had in 38 now yeah. it's, a, it's a different world it, people are different uh, kids are different and how they take stories you know and, and what kind of stories are meaningful for them and 
that's the way it ought to be. And I think one of the geniuses of Superman is that he has been able to adapt, you know, it, um, and still charm and be meaningful to every generation of at least young people. Because you know? some of the first big changes were in the 80s when they had the crisis in Infinite Earths where DC just kind of cleaned house. I mean, they merged all the worlds, and you had the death of several characters, and they killed off two mainstays. They killed um, the Barry Allen Flash. Mm -hmm. Then I actually cried when they killed Supergirl. Mom's like, what's wrong? Supergirl's dead. <laughs> and she's looking like, a child has lost his mind. I was like, no, they killed her. You know, and then the whole thing got restarted, and none of that, none of that history happened. They relaunched with Man of Steel, John Byrne, and people complained that he had ruined the character. I thought... No, this is, it's the 80s. This is a oh, new, yeah. it's a whole new way yeah. of bringing people in. And so we've gone through these different reboots and restarts. We've had Zero Hour and Blackest Night, and now we have The 52. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, DC, I said The 52. Yeah. I'm, ha I'm having, I'm struggling. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I don't, I, ha I didn't get involved in that. I, no. I had spent 10 years doing Superman projects, and I said, you know, I think this is a good time to kind of stop. Uh, mm -hmm. It's, uh, and so I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I've seen, I've read about the lack of trunks and certain directions and things. But. And I, th I think, and when you talk like a visual media, you get so used to seeing uh, certain things. But I know the costume has been updated and stuff. So, you know, I have grown to deal with no trunks. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I remember when uh, they, that Alan Moore wrote the, those, the wonderful Farewell to the Silver Age. Mm -hmm two-part story that preceded John Burns. I thought, oh, they're going to they're gonna ruin this. You know, um, how can you, how can you just say that stuff didn't exist? But the John Burns stuff, at least for the first several years, I thought was brilliant. I loved you know? it. It was, it was great. It was fresh and it was modern. And, it, well, and I think you have to do that you every have, once in a while. It, well, it, it gave them a, a whole new look. You know, I kept thinking, well, it's the 80s. Clark isn't going to be this pushover. He's a journalist. He's living in this city. Lois Lane, I never really saw her as a delicate character. I mean, she's a, she was a female reporter, but she embodied the 80s, you know, Pulitzer Prize winner, and then making Luthor a corporate, yeah, you know, right. takeover. It's like, this makes sense. So, you know, everything, you know, we have to adapt with. <laughs> well, you do. I mean, and you also have to, have to adapt by the 80s. DC knew that its readership was no longer, you know, 8 to 14 year no. old. It was, <laughs> the demographic was like uh, 16 to, to 30, really. Yeah. Uh, so you were writing for older people, and so you had to take that into consideration, you know. And I think it has to be that way. As long as you maintain the integrity of the character and the certain elements that make him Superman, he can live forever, you know. It also annoyed me, or annoys me, that people say that he's, you know, corny or he's from another era, you know. So are all of them, you know. Um, so what's, what's that? Mean? What's the, yeah. Uh, and <clears throat> if we talk about. People say, well, they were corny out of the age. We look at uh, Kingdom Come, which kind of looked at those different generations, and someone saying, well, he's the, the Boy Scout. He's not mm. relevant. He won't do a threat. And I'm going, but shouldn't our heroes have, they should inspire, you know, yeah. to kind of have that quality? You know, there is a better way. You don't have to kill your enemy. You don't have to, that, not that dark hero aspect, but kind of inspire. Yeah, I always thought it was amusing that Alan Moore, who basically started that whole dark superhero, yeah. lived to regret it. You know, and, and said it like, oh, what did I do? Because for the next 25, 30 years, every superhero was angst ridden and right. suicidal and you know, involved in genocide and you know, all this other kind of stuff. And uh, I don't think you need to have a Superman who has to be dark and dark. brooding. And no, you don't. I mean, that's not Superman. I mean, I think there's room for a Superman who is a, a, you know, a philanthropist and a humanitarian. Uh, and who enjoys what he's doing, you know. Um, and he certainly, you could put that in a more adult storyline. I mean, I, when I did the novel about Superman, which was a great privilege to actually have four and a half years to work with a character that I that I love. Um, you know, I, I, there's lots of murders and all kinds of dark things in that novel, but uh, you know, I, I still wanted to have the Clark Kent yeah. who kind of liked what he was doing, and it was like this was fun, you know, to, to fly. And that's what I enjoyed, because when I read it, like, he loves being Superman. And I like the way you described heat vision. His eyeballs always felt gummy after he used it. I thought, well, yeah, because we don't know what he feels like. I'm like, what's like? you got heat shooting out of your eyes. That, yeah. that can't tickle. 
I'm glad you, that's one of my favorite inventions. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just thought that's such a unique way of describing because we don't know what his perspective is. We've never really, we just yeah. see him use it. Yeah. It was great actually to, to do that. It was fun. People had asked me, was it daunting? And I, you know, it, 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 was, it really wasn't. It was just incredible fun to, uh, I mean, imagine yourself in, in a kind of actorish way as writers do. What is it like to fly? Yeah. <laughs> you know, there was, there was a chapter in the novel that I, I had to cut out because the novel was way too long, which I, it was when Clark takes airplane lessons because if he's going to fly, he's got to know what the world looks like and how to identify yeah. different things from the air. And I'm thinking, like, if I could fly, I'd be flying around. I wouldn't know where to land. You know, like, how do I know? That's... Is it land? Is it someone's house? Yeah. Like, so I had him take flying lessons and someone teaches him how to, you know, that's a field and that's a farm and, and that, that's this and that's water. Um, I probably took it out of the novel. But I, it was such a great fun because to put yourself in this character and imagine what it would be like if you could pick something up. Because flight's one of those things we all, you know, he can fly. Yeah. And what does it mean to do that? Like, how would you do it? Like, would you swim through the air? Because we've seen the different actors over the years. We, you know, during George Reeves, he would just leap out a window, and then they had him. And then when they got to Christopher Reeve, we have that great scene of him flying over the earth, kind of doing that swoop, that whole um, swooping past it. Yeah. Dean Cain, they had the whole, I'm going up. Yeah. But then with this last one, I have to admit, I really enjoyed the flight sequences. Um, I like that glamour of just yeah. the, um, kind your of like, arms at your side and just kind of floating. Yeah, I don't know, I think it too. So, so like doing it as if you were a fish, mm -hmm. um, you know, more than the plunge. The plunge thing, yeah. yeah, yeah. But but that, again, that's what I'm talking about. It's like it was so much fun to imagine when I was writing that. What, what would it be like? So that's great. There are a lot of books out there right now on superheroes. Grant Morris wrote one. You've got the great one, Our Hero. But then there's been books, you know, the legality of superheroes. You. Why do you think at this point there's so much going on about whether it's Superman, superheroes, um, there's a there's another book that just came out and I'm reading it right now. Superman I think it's just called Superman. And it's a whole another history of him. Larry, Larry Ty has a book. Yeah. And, and then there's yeah. Well, I think a lot of those books are coming out because it's the seventy fifth anniversary. That that's, that's that's true. And I think a lot of the books come out because um, so much of our, our our movie going is about superheroes throughout the year, so clearly, you know, it's, it's you know, there can be books to support one's interest in, in, in that. But I, I think it's, uh, you know, why Superman and philosophy, Superman and the law, are mm -hmm. superheroes and this and that. Um, it's interesting because the, the character of the superhero has become um, a way of kind of talking about ourselves and how we, how we change and what do we think of as heroism. Um, and, you know, things like superheroes in the law, so the lawyers get a chance to talk about, you know, privilege and, and uh, uh, what would happen if, if these superheroes actually destroyed buildings, who would be responsible, yeah. all those kinds of things. And the philosophy uh, books, um, the last couple, there's a whole, th there's like the philosophy of Green Lantern, the philosophy of Batman, yeah. and they just come the philosophy of Superman, yeah. just looking at those. Yeah, and a way of, of kind of pulling, you know, um, uh, certain uh, elements from Greek philosophy and Roman philosophy and, and so it's, a, it's an opportunity for uh, those people in the fields to um, write about their field utilizing uh, a, a kind of figures that, that are meaningful to contemporary. They're kind of like, they're like our version of the, a modern myth. They're yeah, they are. You know, and I think you can, you can go too far with that. You know, and, and I think it's so many people try and say they are. They are Hercules, and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in a way of trying to justify comics. Right. You know, it's, it's that kind of defensive thing. But so I think you can go too far with that. But in, in many ways, they are um, uh, heroes who can tell us about ourselves or where we are. For instance, I've complained for the past you know, decade and a half, really, about I think that some superheroes are becoming. It's, it's becoming. It's not about people taking care of ordinary human beings. It's about these super beings who yeah. are only concerned with themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's a certain kind of militant, uh, martial kind mm -hmm. of uh, mentality, um, which superheroes in the 60s did not have, yeah. you know, and certain superheroes in the 40s. 
they might have been marshaled, but it was World War II. But um, so I, I think, in some ways, it, I, I object to that because it's it's, um, it's these characters are only concerned with other super beings; they're not concerned with mortals, you know. Uh, but that tell that can tell us something. Like, why did that happen, and why do we respond to that? Why do we think that that's okay? So, in a, in a way, you can look at the invasion of the body snatchers mm -hmm. in the 1950s, and who were we? That what is that saying about this, the culture in the 50s? Just as a, someone 10 years from now can look at superheroes and what they were in the, in the early 2000s after 9/11, all those kinds of things, and say, okay, this tells us something about the culture. Because when we said 9/11, I thought about how the comic industry they put out those beautiful books, heroes. Folks from DC and Vertigo had those great, just images, and I thought, well, this is this is what heroes do. You know, they inspire, they they do all that. And I bought several copies, and when I was at the time, everybody in the building wanted yeah those books. They, they wanted the heroes, the typical heroes who who protect us, yeah. who inspire us, um, and and uh, kind of embody our values. We can kind of project. Uh, what we think we are onto those heroes, and I, I think right after 9/11, all those those stories, we, the heroes basically dropped their dark trappings for yeah. a while and took on this things kind of like we they, needed that kind of image, you know, just as we needed the heroic image of the firemen and the policemen, you know. Uh, and, but then quickly after that, what worried me is that the comics began to become very aggressive and, and dark, and you know, you know, you know, ready to invade. Uh, yeah, you know, metaphorically, countries just like we've invaded Iraq, and so, I mean, but it's really it can tell us a lot about who we are. There were because they're kind of a reflection of our undercurrents. I remember um, from the '70s, Green Lantern and Green Arrow going cross country, right? And it was very non-science fiction. They were doing just average things, yeah. and you know, was it Gil Kane who wrote it? The whole thing. You've this African American says to Green Lantern, "You saved." The, the purple guy, the orange guy, the green guy, but what have you done for the black right, man? Right, yeah. And I thought, wow, and I'm going, I'm 11 years old, going, this is a powerful thing we're <laughs> talking about. What have you really done for the everyday person? But then they dealt with drug use with Speedy, um, but we saw like the Teen Titans just going, well, I've got to go to college and save the world. There was kind of that, they still had an everyday quality, even though they lived in this big shiny tower. Right. Yeah, I think that's what it's, they've lost a lot, you know, that certain quality of them. Now they're demigods, you know, and they're, they're just above us, which is a little scary in a way. And it's, uh, I find it very hard to identify with, with the superhero um, I had for, for a while. But that's probably just me and, and a generational thing. And I kept thinking so too, because I'm going, we have these big cosmic clashes, but where's that? There was a line in Justice League of Justice League Unlimited. And Green Arrow says, I'm just, I deal with street crime. You guys take care of the big whatever, big monsters. And Batman goes, but sometimes those monsters step on the little guy. And But that character kept coming back, yeah, but you guys scare me. <laughs> I'm just a guy with a gimmicky arrow, you know. Yeah. And they even they did it again with what I call the seven soldiers of victory. One when you had, you know, the Shining Knight, and Vigilante, some of those characters from the 30s and 40s. They didn't have a superpower. But they put their lives in the line for the everyday yeah. person. So it's kind of like that kind of then embodiment of they don't have powers, but they still inspire. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah but now they have powers that are just. Everybody throws a cosmic ray. Uh, I'm invulnerable. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and the earth is just like one of their. They, life goes on. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like the talk about myth, right? It's kind of like the Roman Zeus and all of them. Mm -hmm. just, Using Earth as a kind of battleground or a playground, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so. Where do you think heroes going to be? And in, in tying this all up, because you know he has been fat. He's faster than a speeding bullet. He's more powerful. Um, it, it came to this quote that I found from Grant Morrison's Super Gods. Um, actually, it's as if Superman is more real than we are. We writers come and go, generations of artists leave their interpretations, and yet something persists, something that is always Superman. Some version of him, whether it's Superman himself or Captain Marvel or some 
essence of Superman. Do you think that will continue on through time? Each generation will kind of remake it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, when you think of all the people who have written Superman um, and drawn Superman, it, it, it's exploded exponentially, you know, in the really since the 60s. You know, at first there was a handful of people who had written Superman stories and, and drew Superman stories. And, and now <laughs> there's thousands of people who have done Superman stories. And yet, I mean, some are bad as stories and yeah. some are violate the, you know, Superman's you core, know, essence. core essence and no one pays any attention to them. That's true. But what comes through is that somehow the, uh, when all is said and done, there is this this Superman that will come, you know, it'll be the Superman of this summer and then five years from now there'll be another sure. Superman you know, movie and there'll be somebody new and they'll go off in another direction, then that'll be Superman. And as long as the certain core values, um, and that's what's important to me, as a writer, you know you don't violate your character's integrity, um, and you you want them to do surprising things and new things, uh, but you can't. You have to. They have to act out of that core integrity, or else the character is is, is flawed as conceived. So, um, I think the miracle of, of Superman. Uh, I mean, is that he's kept on going? Yeah. I mean, Green Lantern has come along and been canceled, and then comes back, and you know the There's whole is new, canceled and comes come back. back. But he's been there month after month after month. It's it's really remarkable, um, and I think there's something there. It's something that doesn't last that long. That doesn't say something. Yeah. Tom, thank you for being here. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. I'm Eric Russell. I've been here at Richmond Triangle Players with Tom DeHaven, and we've been discussing 75 years of Superman, truth, justice in the American way. Let's see where he goes in the next 25 years when he turns 100. You never know where I'll turn up next, so tune in next time. See ya.